Oh, it's a good thing no one was on. We're muted. We're on. We're live. Well, yeah, you are. It's just you're muted. Just at what? I didn't turn on the microphone, so now people can hear you. Oh, until now they couldn't hear anything. No, but I don't think anyone's on because no one said anything. Uh huh. To go from one level to the other level, it's compared in the in Hasidus. There are two levels of learning Talmud. Many Jews went into exile to Babylon and, and set up centers of Torah learning. And then there were Jews who remained in Eretz Yisrael, did not leave Eretz Yisrael, did not go into exile after the destruction of the temple. And they continued learning in Eretz Yisrael. So we have the ta Talmud, the way it was learned in Jerusalem, which is the West, and the Talmud, the way it's learned in ba Babylon, which is the East. Two different styles of learning the oral law. The Talmud, the way it's learned in Jerusalem, is a higher level. So in the yeshivas, we don't learn it so much. The main learning in the yeshivas is the way the Talmud was taught in Babylon. That's called Talmud Bavli. Okay. If a person it says, speaks in the Talmud about a great sage, an Amoy called Rabbi Zaira. Rabbi Zaira thirsted for godliness and was not content to learn Talmud in Babylon. And he kept on asking his Rebbe for permission to go to Eretz Yisrael. And he didn't get it. So it says in the Talmud, he fasted. One version says he fasted 40 consecutive fasts in order to, to would be worthy to go to learn Torah in Yerushalayim. And another version is he fasted a hundred fasts. Hasidus explains this. I mean, the, the simple meaning is he fasted it in order to do a deeper, deeper tshuva, to be more what Hashem expected of him so that he would be worthy to receive permission to learn Torah the way it's learned in Jerusalem, in the West. Hasidus explains the panemius from a spiritual point of view, he was fasting in order to refine himself, to be on a level that he could learn the Talmud, the way it's learned in Jerusalem. And then it goes on to say that in order to learn the Talmud on a higher level, he had to completely forget his learning. He had to empty himself out. Because if he continued thinking in the old way of thinking, he would never be able to understand the way you have to think to learn Talmud on the level of Jerusalem. He had to completely for, <coughs> empty his mind out to take on a completely new configuration of his intellect. And from this we learn a metaphor of lower and upper, to go from, so it says also in Hasidus, to go in, in Gan Eden, from a lower level of Gan Eden to a higher level of Gan Eden. Or even just to get into Gan Eden, the whole way you understand life here in this physical world has to be taken out of you. Because when you're com coming into a world of spiritual truth, absolute truth, the way you think in this world of falsehood doesn't work anymore. We are all accustomed to thinking of the way things are in a world of lies and darkness where the truth is hidden. And to confront the truth, we have to get our whole awareness of this world out of our head. So therefore it says in the Shama, before it can even get into Gan Eden, it has to pass through a river of forgetting. As you have to go through this river called Dinor. And it, it, it cleanses your mind and your intellect so that you can now approach a higher level of understanding. They're not, not sunken into the values of this false materialistic world. 
If anybody has a question about why is this materialistic world considered false, just open the newspaper. There's a war going on. What's it all about? Is there any truth there here? What are the values? What do people want to accomplish? You see what a false world it is. How people dedicate their lives for nothing. Their lives, other people's lives for nothing. Similarly, it says in Hasidus, when the soul in the afterlife, in the world to come, Gan Eden, goes from one level to the next level, it also has to go through a similar experience of forgetting. Leave a move over one more seat so I can keep my eyes on you. Thank you. Can't hear you. Will we switch the Talmud that we learn when the Shiach comes, how there's a thought that will go from? No, we won't switch. Okay. We won't switch. The halacha may be different, but the Torah is still Torah. We'll still learn Torah. No, the Talmud. Yeah, Talmud is Torah. But how you're saying that, like, the your Shami Talmud is kind of at a higher level, so would we be able to study that one at a higher level if when Mashiach comes, the world is at a higher level. Yes, we will continue learning it and understanding it in the lower level and in the higher level. But we would study it more than we study it now. Yes. Okay. Like Beis Shammai, Beis Hillel, they learned, the, they had the same teachers and they learned diametrically opposed ideas. And uh, But the Torah says on them, these and those are both the words of the living God. It just is this the, is this coming from the perspective of Chesed or is this coming from the perspective of Gevura? But the bottom line is, what do we do? What's the halacha? So for now, the halacha was established two thousand years ago, as like Beis Hillel, except in eighteen cases where the halacha is like Beis Shammai. In the future, it will be reversed. The Loha will be more like Beish, will be like Beis Shammai. And in some cases, it will be like Beis Hillel. So the, to get back to the point, to go from one level to the next level requires a tremendous a, a remake, a remake of your whole intellect and your approach and understanding. And the fact that it says that it's a lower and there's a higher, that tells it that there's more than one. And if there's more than one, how many more than one? As many as you can, can possibly imagine. Because we're dealing with variables that are very subtle. And if the difference between 10 and one is the difference of 10, what's the difference between 0.1 and 0.01? or 0 0.001, or 0 0.0001. There's still a difference. So the fact that it says that there's a lower and an upper, that tells us that there's more than two, there's, there's thousands. So that's what it says here, that there are 18,000 tzaddikim standing before the Yebishter. But these are tzaddikim who are not complete tzaddikim, that's why there's so many levels. Whereas the level called the complete tzaddik, complete is complete. <clears throat> so is the Friediger Rebbe on the same level as his, fa as his father? Is our Lev Rebbe on the same level as the previous Rebbe? Or are they all one? Are they all joined into one? general level another way just to confuse the issue a little bit more is that at tzaddik a tzaddik, a tzaddik is directed by his yetzer toy his yetzer toy we learned in chapter two of the tanya chapter two begins with the words 
Hanefesh Hashenis be Yisrael, the second soul of the Jewish person who chelik elokam imal mamish is a part of God. Mamish. So that means the Tzadik Goma we're talking about is talking to God, listening to God, doing everything what God wants. He, he, he's, he's Hashem's servant. But Moshe Abda is Moshe's Hashem's servant. They believed in Moshe and, his, and in Moshe, his servant. <coughs> There's no vestige anymore of evil, of anything that is not God. Whatever he does is God. Incarnate. Got to be careful how you say that. You, you worship the Rebbe. No, I worship God. But the Rebbe and God is one thing. Anything the Rebbe does, that's what God wants. <clears throat> that's what it means. Tzadik v'toiv loy. He has toiv. What is toiv? Toiv is Hashem. Ain toiv el Right, Tova? Tova is a... They said the Baal Shem Tov is the master of the good name. <laughs> what was Mrs. Shem Tov? <laughs> we knew a woman, Tsara Shem Tov. <laughs> Where are you from? Any Shem Tovs from your part of the woods? My mom's Shokhan are Shem Tovs. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so that's where we're up to in chapter 10. Um, where is it going to start here? Here, page 158, the middle. Ah, now we're changing gears. We're moving now into the conclusion. Very <laughs> complex, but quite understandable. Ah, al milas tzaddik Omer. However, when we're talking about the complete tzaddik, Hava, the complete tzaddik and the complete tzaddikus, who's a complete tzaddikus? Rebetzin. Rebetzin. Who is this lady coming in? What? Toby. Oh, Toby Spielman. Yeah, you were here yesterday. Okay. Hedva, no. Samantha, not here. No, no. Tova, yes. No. Hi, no. Chava Krimko, yes. Ariel, no. Liba, yes. Circa, circa, yes, circa. Sharon, no. Anybody I didn't, I didn't Rachel. Rachel. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning. <laughs> okay, we're very lofty subjects today. The, here, the complete Sadik. What is the complete Sadik? So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yahoy, who is the author of what great book? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yahoy, author of Da. So what? Zohar, author of the Zohar, source book, first source book of Jewish mysticism. Not the first, Abraham, Avram Avinu wrote the first book. <coughs> Maybe he had it from Adam himself. Rabbi Shimon says, I have seen Raisi B'nai Aliyah. Well, Aliyah, we know what Aliyah is. Aliyah means going up to the Torah, right? Make Aliyah. Gonna go there, it's his soul, make Aliyah. Aliyah means going out. I've seen the masters of Aliyah, like a chess master, a person who's proficient, expert, beyond compare, a master of Aliyah. I've seen spiritually such great people, masters of Aliyah, and they are very few. That's what we've said many times, right? Not many on this level, few and far between. Masters of Aliyah. Why are they called masters of Aliyah? Anybody take a guess? Either guess or read the next paragraph. That's the way you learn Tanya. You learn Tanya carefully and, and you learn a few words and it raises a question. 
Read the next line, you get the answer to the question. It's, it's an active intellectual process, learning Tanya. You gotta be with it, every word, every, every sentence. You have to be involved. Ava, are you involved? Yes. Do you have a book? Hard to be involved if you don't have a book. Give this girl a book. We're on page 158, towards the bottom, 158. Who is this? Is, is this rap report? Yes, Leon. Yeah. You look different. You put your hair differently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, almost didn't recognize you. Okay. So why is he, nobody answered the question. Why is he called a master of ascent? B'nai Aliyah, Master of Aliyahs. Okay, so the Alt Rebbe answers us. Chaba, move your chair to your right. Move to one chair to the right. Yes. That's where you come, right between Sarah and Rachel. No. Oh, God. To your right. Your chair was stuck. Okay. Uh -huh. So you move your chair to the left in order to come to the right. That's a dirty exactly. principle too. Sometimes we have to go back in order to go forward. Exactly. exactly right. Okay. <clears throat> we have to learn. Baal Shem Tov says we have to learn from everything we see or hear exactly. in the service of Hashem. The answer is because he's called Bnei Aliyah because everything that they come in contact with, every encounter. Every involvement with people or things in the world, every mitzvah, they take the pure physical thing, which we learned comes from Klippus Noga, and they use it for Hashem and elevate it and bring it into the chambers of holiness. They bring it into the spiritual temple of God by showing, ah, oh, you see what this was created for? This isn't just a fruit on a tree. It's an esrog. I'm going to do a mitzvah with it. With the name, Hashem's name. Sheh kedeshamu b'mitzvah v'tzivanu on latilas lulav. I'm going to do a mitzvah with it. And I bring it into holiness. And you're going to go after 120 years to Gan Eden. You're going to have a special chamber that's going to be yours. You'll have there a table and a lamp and a bed. And all the mitzvah objects that you did mitzvahs with are going to be shining lights. In your own holy chamber that you made, you decorated it yourself with all your mitzvahs that you did, all the good deeds. And you'll be amazed because there'll be some things you did that are, you thought they were great accomplishments. And they're not so important. And the other things you did, you totally forgot about. You, never, you didn't think they were significant at all. And they are going to be bright lights of holiness. You didn't even realize what you were doing. You gave charity to some lady in front of 770 and you smiled and asked her how she's doing. And you made her happy. And <laughs> there's going to be a huge play. Okay. So that's why they're called masters of Aliyah, because they take the physical world, everything that gets its life from Klippus Noga and elevate it and bring it into holiness. And if they're Bali Chuva, then they take things not just from Klippus Noga, then they take things even from the three impure levels of Klippa. From beyond the red line, the other side of the red line where we're not allowed to go. And they went there, but they came back and they, they went like they went down into deepest Africa and they brought back the famous lines from Arthur from the playwright, by God, he came, Uncle Ben came out rich. But it takes a deep tshuva, and you're not allowed to go there in the first place because it's very dangerous. Okay, so that's what it means. He's called a, one of the masters of aliyah, ascent, because they take the physical world and they bring it up into the holy chambers of God by doing mitzvahs. By having your drink and, and, and eating your yogurt and your, your healthy foods and having the energy to learn Torah, 
So that food now becomes part of your flesh and blood. And that food which could not learn Torah becomes Torah. The flesh and blood that you, that you manufacture from the chicken on Shabbos and the meat and the cholent and the carrots and the beans all becomes Torah because you learn Torah and do misses with that energy. That's very mystical. <laughs> it is. It's much as simply, it makes sense. It's very mystical. So, Carrying on with this, I think, like it says in the Zoyer Bagdam in the introduction, there was a great, 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 great rabbi, unparalleled in the, in the Talmud, time of the Talmud, a colleague of Rabbi Yehuda Nossi who wrote, what did Rabbi Yehuda Nossi write? He wrote the Mishnah, good for you, Sirka. He wrote the Mishnah, he was the first one ever to write down the Mishnah. Without the Mishnah, we can't be Jewish. The Mishnah is the compendium of all the Jewish laws telling us what the Torah means. Without the Mishnah, we have no clue how to do any single mitzvah. It says you should write, take a simple mitzvah like a mezuzah. Everybody knows what a mezuzah is, right? What is it? What's it written on? How do you know? What words should be written on it? How do you make the letters? Where do you put it? I took down a mezuzah once from a person's house. I opened it up. There was a photocopy of the Ten Commandments. Was that a mezuzah? No. Without the, the, the Mishnah telling us what a mezuzah is, where it goes, and how you make it, we don't know what it is. And similarly with all the other commandments. Without the Mishnah, we don't know how to do them. So Rabbi Yehuda Anasi was the first one to write the Mishnah down because the Roman persecutions were so severe, they did not allow the teaching of the Torah. The Torah would have been completely forgotten like it was during 70 years of communist persecution in the Soviet Union. They produced a whole three generations of people who know nothing, next to nothing of Judaism except what they, they saw by their bubbies that what their bubbies did in, in, did in secret. Except for Chabad. Chabad was the only one that kept going underground. That cellar under the house until they could leave Russia. Okay, that's the only that, that's how, how, how Jew, Judaism stayed alive during the 70 years of Soviet repression. Okay, so <clears throat> Rebbe Yehuda wrote the Mishnah. Rebbe Chia, we're talking about, was his colleague. Rebbe Chia was also great. He wrote down the rejected Mishnahs, there were different versions of the Mishnah. Because everybody at Mount Sinai gave it over slightly, he worded it slightly differently, according to the inclination of his soul, like Beis Hamach, Shammai is kindly in general, and Beis Shammai is strict in general. There are exceptions, but in general, that's the way they are. So according to, <clears throat> if his soul was inclined to Chesed, or if his soul was inclined to Gevura, that's how he taught the same mitzvah. <clears throat> both versions are true. They're both Torah. What do we do? We do, we follow the majority. We do what Beis Hillel said, except in certain exceptions. Okay, now there were a lot of versions of the oral Torah 
which were not accepted for the authoritative version that was redacted, is that right word? By Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Judah the Prince, Rabbi Judah the Prince, was the descendant of King David. He was the first one to write it down because if he didn't write it down, Judaism would be forgotten, totally forgotten. So he saved, he saved, he's like Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe gave us a Torah, Rabbi Yehuda gave us a Torah. He saved Torah for the future. So Rabbi Chia, he wrote down all the rejected versions. They're called Brises. You know the first lines of the Tanya? We learn the third parak of Nida, right? They, they administer an oath to an Ashama before he's born. Be righteous, don't be wicked. That's a Brisa. It's not a Mishnah. It's, it, that's one of the rejected Mishnahs. So they're also holy. Rebbe Chia wanted to go visit Rebbe Shimon Bar Yehoi in heaven. This is what the time, time is. This is heavy stuff. This is mystical stuff. Rebbe Chia was capable of reviving the dead, bringing a dead person back to life. He did it. It's recorded. He did it. The Emperor Antoninus was nursed together with Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. They were nursed together. It's an extraordinary story. I'll tell you the whole story sometime later because there's a lot of details. But they were nursed together. And they became lifelong friends. But the Emperor could not go to visit the chief rabbi. So he had a tunnel made from his palace to Rabbi Yehuda's place where he lived but he didn't want anybody to know he was going there so he was accompanied by a soldier and he killed the soldier when he arrived so to accompany Rebbe the the, 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 the Antoninus the philosopher emperor of Rome to Rebbe Yehuda it was a death sentence to the soldier and nobody was allowed to be together with Rebbe Yehuda and one time he came, and Rebbe Chia was there. The, the emperor was not pleased. He was very, very upset that somebody was there, knew that he had come to see the Rebbe. So he said, tell your friend to go outside and tell the soldier I want to see him. The soldier was dead. He had killed him. So how was Rebbe here? What was Rebbe here doing? He went out to tell the soldier. And finds the soldier lying dead. It's not explained. What did they do with the dead soldiers? So I, we don't know. Maybe afterwards Rebbe Yehuda would arrange for them to be buried. Anyway. Now he's stuck. If he runs away... He'll get caught. He'll be killed for disobeying the emperor. If he comes back and says the soldier is dead, he'll be killed for bringing the bad news to the emperor. What was he going to do? He can't disobey the emperor's order. Go tell the soldier I want to see him. He revived the soldier. So the <laughs> emperor was very surprised. <laughs> he turned to Rabbi Yehuda. He said, listen, I see that the least of you can revive the dead, but make sure that nobody's here next time. You understand? <laughs> I don't want anybody here next time. So this is Rebbe Chia. This is who we're talking about here. This is Rebbe Chia. He wanted to visit Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochoi, author of the Zohar, <clears throat> in his holy chamber in heaven. And he hears a voice coming out, a heavenly voice. Man min if any of you have not been capable of transforming darkness into light, that is to say, the physical darkness of this false world that hides godliness into godliness, but time in Maria Lemiska and transforming that which is bitter into that which is sweet, is transforming Averas into, into misfits, right? Ad 
you dare not come here. You cannot come here. You cannot get in here. This is only for people who are B'nai Aliyah, who can transform darkness to light and bitterness to sweet. So this is what it means of B'nai Aliyah. And this is, now you can understand why there are very few. But a person who's not on this level, he's a righteous person, but not on this level. For the, for, of those, we have many thousands. And this is what it says in the very first Mishnah. Okay, Mishnah. Who wrote the Mishnah? Rebbe? Who wrote the Mishnah? I just said it, I'm talking to you about it all morning. Who wrote the Mishnah? Rebbe Yehuda the Prince. In the first Mishnah that we say before we say the, the ethics of the Father. Fathers, from Pesach till Shavuos, from Shavuos until Rosh Hashanah, <coughs> on Shabbos, after Mincha, we say the ethics of the fathers, Pirkei Aves, and they begin, Amekulam Tzadikim, your people are all Tzadikim. What kind of Tzadikim? Not, not quite. Uh, the lower level Tzadikim. But they're righteous. Your people are all righteous. Okay, that's the end of this first part of the last movement, so to speak, in musical terms of, the, of this chapter. That's the end of the first part. Now we move on to the second part. Another reason that they're called B'nai Aliyah is because everything they do is for the sake of Hashem. Hashem is on high. Everything is for the sake of Hashem who is on high. So they're called masters of ascent. So the first level is that they bring everything up to Hashem. From the world of darkness, they bring it into the world of light. The second level is that they themselves <clears throat> are so attached to Hashem that that's all their, their whole interest is only to serve Hashem. So they're, they're called masters of Aliyah because of their personal Aliyah. And in all the mitzvahs that they do, they are only doing it for the sake of the one above. To say, how are you doing today? Say, thank the one above. And their service is directed to the most high, high, high level, high beyond high. Their service of a God in Asay Tev. Asay Tev is doing positive mitzvahs. When they do a mitzvah, they do the mitzvah told solely for the sake of Hashem, like that famous book by Ruhama, what's her name? All for the boss. Her father was like, everything he did was just for the sake of, the, of Hashem. All for the boss. Very interesting book. You should get a hold of it. It's probably in the library. I forget her last name, now, Ruhama, whatever it is. Wrote this bio, a story, biography of her father, who was a unique Jew in the years when there was not organized Judaism here in, in America. He used to, when the ships would come in with immigrants, he would greet the ship. He would run down to greet the ship to offer a Jewish person a place where he could eat and stay till he got himself established and get kosher food. He could, it, was, it wasn't so easy to get kosher food either. Everything was dedicated, everything he said, everything I do is for the boss, <clears throat> meaning Hashem. So this, this tzaddikim, everything they do is for Hashem, the one above. Adreim <clears> hamailis, <throat> not to any level that you can understand, but any level you can understand, even higher than that and higher than that. You might think, why does a person serve Hashem? Because he thirsts for godliness. They say this, for this level, no, this is beyond that. Because if you're thirsting for godliness, that's selfish. You're just in it for yourself. It's a very high level of, of godliness, very high level of achievement, but it's selfishness. Like those people who criticize religious people and say, ah, they're just selfish like everybody else. They're not interested. They think they're going to go to, to heaven. Like the Muslims say, they'll go to heaven, they get 70 virgins for 70 years. They forget that the virgins are all 70 years old. <clears throat> anyway, there we go. 
We'll come back to this tomorrow. Bezras Hashem, 8.30. Thank you very much, everybody. So we learned what is the B'nai Ali, what are called the B'nai Ali, the Tzadikim, complete Tzadikim, who serve Hashem on this high level that they're called, according to Rabbi Shem Yehoi, masters of ascent, of Aliyah. We learn two versions. One is they have to convert the world of darkness into light, bitterness into sweet. And the second version is because when they perform mitzvahs, they do it for the sake of the one above. Have a good day. Yesterday, we were talking about the pressures. Like, is Korea going to be like double as long? Like, how does it work? No, it's one extra earlier. Because wasn't last Shabbos a special time? Not this past one, one before, which is going. Okay. But it didn't seem like long. It was when they days. finish with one Torah, instead of putting it away and being done, they take out another Torah. And, and it's one little, well, it's a paragraph. It's not like okay. but it's a short earlier. It's not like a whole other pressure. Just like a little bit. So what we really, it's a whole Pasha, but when we say Pasha, we're actually not referring to a Pasha. We use that term wrong. A Pasha means a section in the Torah, which could be six Pesukim, could be 10 Pesukim, could be 15 Pesukim. Because the last Pasha was like 90 A Pasha, when we say like Pasha's Bai, right. or Pasha's Tzav, or Barashas, is really a bunch of little Pashas put together. Right. It's actually called a Sidra, but we just call it a Pasha colloquially. So that's where the confusion comes in. Okay, but that's a very good question, I must say. Oh, hey, good morning, everybody. We're online. We don't want to be online. How do we turn off? Ah.